there is a view of history that's called nostalgia. A wistful looking back, a tinted longing for times past, better times, simpler times, when life was a slow and graceful dance. After the ball is over, after the break of morn, after the dancers leaving, after the stars are gone, many a heart is aching. If you could read them all, many the hopes that have vanished after the ball. Of all the times Americans look back to with longing for a better lost life, the 50 years following the Civil War have the strongest pull. So much so, they're called the good old days. The last decade of the 19th century was the gay 90s. Earlier, it was called the Gilded Age. In fact, much of it was neither gay nor gilded. In fact, it was a time of grinding poverty for many, fantastic privilege for a few. The clash of privilege and poverty shook the nation, pushed it kicking and screaming into the 20th century on a wave of protest and reform. We've lost the innocence and inherited the turmoil of the time. In many ways, the America we have was invented in these 50 years. It was a time ornate, complex, at once graceful and ugly and overdone, and above all else, confident. These were the confident years. If any one word can label a time so complex, it is confident. Americans looked back on a glorious past, forward to an even more glorious future. Things were good and would get even better. Yet the time began with mourning, not ragtime, but a dirt. Coffin that passes through lanes and streets, through day and night with the great cloud darkening the land. The president was dead, shot by an assassin. During two weeks of mourning, the North began to see the murder as the final act of Southern treason, a Confederate conspiracy. The assassin, John Wilkes Booth, was shot. Eight conspirators were found and tried. All were found guilty. Four, these four, were hanged. But many in the North were not satisfied. The South, the Confederacy itself, must be punished. Lincoln had thought differently. With malice toward none, with charity for all, let us strive on to finish the work we are in. The work to be finished was called Reconstruction. It would be hard work. Much of the South was in ruin. A wilderness of ruins, of desolation, of vacant houses, of rotting wharves, of deserted warehouses, of wild weed gardens, of grass-grown streets, of barrenness. In this wasteland grew the weed of bitterness. Ruins could be rebuilt. Hatred was harder to overcome. The song of the unrepentant rebel. I hate the Yankee nation and everything they do. I hate the Constitution, this great republic too. And I don't want no pardon for what I was and am. And I won't be reconstructed, and I don't give a damn. Underneath the emotion, the struggle was political. For blacks and northerners, the Republican Party stood for the right, the Union and freedom. The Democratic Party was the bad old party of traitors and slaveholders. At the start of Reconstruction, the Federal Freedmen's Bureau and the Northern Union League registered waves of black voters in the South, and they voted Republican. For the first time, blacks won seats in Congress, while ex-Confederate whites, elected Democrats, were kept out. Every Southern state legislature included blacks, all Republicans. This is a white view of one of them. The speaker is black, the clerk is black, the doorkeepers are black. At some of the desks sit colored men whose types it would be hard to find outside the Congo. 
the white South saw itself as invaded from within by former slaves, from without by a new northern scavenger, the carpetbagger. Yankees coming into the South for a quick profit often carried bags made of cheap carpeting. Some served as Southern legislators. Others used new black votes to fill those carpet bags with loot from state treasuries. Southern state taxes skyrocketed, a burden carried mainly by whites. In this crude warning, two carpet baggers, one from Ohio, have been left hanging by a mule labeled with a curious code, KKK. Ku Klux Klan. The Klan started in Tennessee soon after the war and spread through the South. An angry answer to Reconstruction. The Klansmen claimed to be the ghosts of dead rebel soldiers come from hell to return the South to white rule. Their costumes were a Halloween nightmare designed to terrorize both blacks and white scalawags. Southerners sympathetic to the aims of Reconstruction. Their first leader, their grand wizard, was Nathan Bedford Forrest, a Confederate general who had, it was said, ordered the massacre of 200 Union blacks at Fort Pillow, one of the ugliest events of the Civil War. Now, uncounted blacks would die in the first year of Klan lynchings and rioting. The Klansmen were simply political terrorists. Blacks and whites were murdered to keep them from voting Republican. To keep some kind of order and to enforce Reconstruction, the South was divided up into military districts and occupied again by federal troops as conquered provinces. The blacks' right to vote, Republican, would be protected. Military occupation was part of the radical program for Reconstruction. The issue had split the Republican Party in two. On one side were the radicals, led by the granite-faced congressman Thad Stephen. On the other side, the president of the United States, Andrew Johnson. On Lincoln's death, Johnson had inherited the presidency. Now, the radicals set out to disinherit him with impeachment. Stevens told him, Unhappy man, behold your doom. Johnson was a Southerner, a Democrat who had been added to the Republican ticket in 1864 to gain votes for Lincoln. Now, as an accidental president, he opposed radical reconstruction with vetoes. Johnson said he was defending the Constitution. The radicals said he was defending the South, an ally of the unrepentant rebel, and worse, an alien enemy. Another radical speaker was Ben Butler, described by Lincoln as, as full of poison gas as a dead dog. In denouncing Johnson in Congress, Butler shouted, This man, by murder most foul, succeeded to the presidency and is the elect of an assassin and not of the people. That sort of speech making was called waving the bloody shirt, recalling the sacrifice of the war to stir political passions against the South, Stevens. If something is not done, the president will be crowned king. So Congress put King Andy on trial in March of 1868 for high crimes and misdemeanors in office. In fact, Johnson's worst crime was that he tried to fire the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, a radical, against the wishes of Congress, as stated in the Tenure of Office Act. Stanton barricaded himself in his office to wait out the trial. The impeachment proceedings went on into May, and tickets for the show were in great demand. When the vote was finally taken, the radicals came up one vote short of impeachment. Andrew Johnson was still president, but his power was gone. His plan for reconstruction and Lincoln's charity for all was over. In November, the radicals had a new man who would not oppose them, Ulysses S. Grant, the union hero of the Civil War and the most popular man in America. Grant's campaign slogan was, let us have peace. It would turn out that the peace he promised and the peace he gave were spelled differently. Grant's two administrations were corrupt. The start of what Mark Twain called the Gilded Age, which sounds nice, 
until you remember that gilding is a cover-up, gold leaf on wormy wood. Grant gave cabinet jobs to his friend, and his friend sold favors to railroads, distillers, gold, and land speculators. When the corruption was uncovered, Grant still supported his friend. He said, I never wanted to get out of a place as much as I did to get out of the presidency. After he left the presidency, his friends robbed him penniless, and he fought one last battle to repair his fortunes. He is here with less than a month to live, his voice gone with cancer, struggling to finish his memoirs. He wrote, A verb is anything that signifies to be, to do, or to suffer. I signify all three. He finished writing a week before he died. The old soldier's last struggle would regain for his family the fortune he had lost. Let us have peace. The political peace was finally bought by the Republicans in the election of 1876. It's been called the stolen election, and for a while, it started talk of another civil war. The Democrats' candidate, Tilden, had won the popular vote over the Republican, Hayes. But the electoral votes of three southern states were claimed by both parties. When the votes were finally counted in Congress, Rutherford B. Hayes was awarded the presidency. A deal had been done. Hayes had promised to pull out all federal troops from the South, and Reconstruction was over. So the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln and emancipation, turned its back on the South and abandoned blacks to white Southern rule. The Republicans turned to the new West to replace the black votes they'd lost, and they turned North, where the money was, to become the party of white Northern industrialists. Blacks turned North, too. With the collapse of Reconstruction, they migrated by the thousands to Northern states, where they were not welcomed, as this crude cartoon shows. Others joined the American Move West, where the welcome was better. Anyone who could push a plow was welcome to help fill the empty plain. Those who stayed in the South fell victims to a new kind of slavery, an economic slavery called sharecropping. As one sharecropper said, they were unfree slaves before the war and free slaves after. And so radical reconstruction failed. But it was our first federal social experiment. And like all such efforts, it needed money and patience, more than we were willing to give at the time. The success was in trying it at all in the first civil rights bills of 1866 and 75, and in the 14th and 15th Amendments, the foundation for victories that would come in another time. The confident years are a mosaic of events and of people. Here's one of those people, Thomas Nast. He drew the unrepentant rebel and many of the cartoons we've seen and will see in the confident years. For many of those years, he was our greatest cartoonist. Nast created a whole zoo of political animals, among them the originals of our two party symbols, the Republican elephant and the Democratic donkey. His sharp pencil helped elect presidents and puncture pretenders. Nasty Nast, some of his subjects called him. Here are two, Horace Greeley and William Marcy Tweed. Tweed was the corrupt political boss of New York. Nast's cartoons helped put him in prison, where he died. Greeley was a famous newspaper editor who ran against Grant and against Nast in the election of 1872. He lost. Three weeks after the election, he died. Driven insane, some people said, by Nast's cartoons of him. But there was a nice Nast, the one who created our image of Santa Claus as a jolly old elf and recreated Uncle Sam into the modern symbol for the U.S. And finally, he created this character. In different versions, 
it would almost replace Uncle Sam as a symbol for America. At least in those confident years when we grew into the richest nation in the world.